Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our virtually speaking series. Um, tonight, we are joined by Latimer Parent and curator Letizia Trevis. Uh, Letizia has curated the highly acclaimed exhibition dedicated to Artemisia Gentileschi, and I'm sure she, um, well, I hope she will uh, correct my pronunciation later. Um, it's currently at the National Gallery. Um, she's going to talk to us about the extraordinary life and art of the most celebrated female painter of the 17th century. Letizia is the James and Sarah Sassoon curator of Latin, uh, um, sorry, later Italian, Spanish, and French 17th century painting at the National Gallery. Following from, on from a successful career in the old master paintings department at Sotheby's, Letizia joined the gallery in, in 2013. Since then, she has curated a number of exhibitions, notably Caravaggio, Murillo, um, Bartolome Bermejo, and um, many more. Letizia was instrumental in the gallery's acquisition of um, Artemisia's painting, uh, the self-portrait as St. Catherine of Alexandria. Before we hear from her, I wanted to very briefly tell you a bit more about the Virtually Speaking series. We launched the program of online talks over the summer as a way of bringing together the Latimer community in the absence of our usual social events. It's been a resounding success. Um, the series is an um, impressive showcase of our community, including teachers, alumni, parents, which to date have raised more than 12 and a half thousand pounds. Um, if you haven't already, I'd have, encourage you to have a look at our full uh, collection of virtually speaking talks, which are on our website. Of course, these events are also fundraisers, and I wanted to thank both our speakers, without whom the series couldn't be possible, and to you, the audience, for supporting the talks. Many of you kindly made a donation when registering for this um, event this evening, which has raised over a thousand pounds already. And that's just fantastic, so thank you. Finally, a couple of house rules for the evening's talk. Everyone will be on mute so you can hear Letizia clearly. Do you please feel free to type questions into the chat facility and we will come to those at the end of her talk. So it just remains for me to welcome Letizia, over to you. Thank you so much, Ruby. And thank you everyone for tuning in. I was very touched that so many of you are interested in Artemisia. <laughs> so tonight I'm going to talk about one of the most significant artists of the uh, 17th century. And actually, arguably, she's one of the most celebrated artists who ever lived. Uh, Artemisia Gentileschi and she's of course the subject of a, a major exhibition now at the National Gallery. I'm showing you here the foyer into the exhibition which runs until the 24th of January and of course is currently closed because of lockdown but it's due to reopen next week. Now Artemisia's career spanned over 40 years. Um, she carried on painting well into her 60s and during that time she worked in Rome, in Florence, in Venice, in Naples and in London. Uh, gaining fame and admiration across Europe, and she counted some of um, Europe's sort of uh, leading rulers among her patrons, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, the King of Spain, and of course Charles I, the King of England. Now, though Artemisia was acclaimed in her own lifetime, uh, she was soon forgotten. So like Caravaggio, in fact, and indeed her father, Orazio Gentileschi, who was also a painter, Artemisia's paintings essentially fell out of favor as taste changed and there was a sort of shift away from these very naturalistic paintings towards a much more classicizing style. And then being a woman, being a female artist, Artemisia wasn't given the space in many of the leading artists' biographies of the period. And so Artemisia effectively became just a footnote often to her father's life. And she was effectively written out of the, of the history books and the art history books. She is essentially a rediscovery of the 20th century and feminist interest in her work over the last 50 years has led uh, to her being championed really as a very inspirational figure of resilience and, and sort of creativity in the face of extremely challenging odds. And she is now sort of championed as a feminist icon. Uh, she continues to inspire films, novels, operas, plays. There's an Amazon TV series that was launched yesterday, apparently. I still haven't had a chance to see it. Um, and it really took a group of feminist art historians to resurrect her reputation in the 1970s. 
And so it's only in re relatively recent times that Artemisia has really been given the recognition she deserves. Now, I'm showing you on the screen a landmark exhibition on women artists um, that took place in a number of American museums in the 1970s, between 1976 and 77. Uh, and it was really the first time a handful of pictures by Artemisia were seen by a kind of wider international public. She was well known within Italy, um, but this was the first time really in America, but also you know, to, to a wider international community. Now, three years after this exhibition, Germaine Greer published a book about the fortunes of women painters. And there she called Artemisia the magnificent exception. And it's very important to remember, it's not that Artemisia was unique in being a successful female artist. There had been plenty of others before her, and I'm showing you here just two, Sofonis Banguisola, who was a portrait painter predominantly, and Fede Galizia, who painted these beautiful still lives um, in the north of Italy. But what made um, Artemisia exceptional was her ability to tackle the kind of subject matter that until that moment had really only been tackled by men. Uh, she didn't restrict herself to these sort of safe genres of portraiture or still life. She really took on these big mythical, bi biblical and historical subjects. And her originality really lay in her very powerful use of imagery, um, and in fact, her exceptional gifts really as a storyteller. She brings a very singular female perspective to her subjects. Um, and in her paintings, you often find that, you know, heroic women um, take sort of center stage and are the key protagonists. So you often see the figures of Judith, Susanna, Cleopatra, Lucretia, again and again. Now, Artemisia's life and work have been the subject of intense scrutiny in uh, recent times, in the last sort of 10 to 15 years. And certain elements of her life story, um, and particularly her rape as a young woman, have sometimes obscured sort of the wider discussions about her art, and in fact, about her very significant achievements as an artist. And of course, any artist's life story, of course, you know, is closely intertwined with the making of their art, and it does inform their art. Um, but I think that this episode of her rape has really shaped and in some sense defined the way in which we speak about Artemisia. And so what I wanted to do in the exhibition at the National Gallery was present a much more balanced and actually uh, a, a sort of a, a more rounded view of Artemisia, both as an artist, but also as a woman. Now, the evidence that we, we have in Artemisia's own letters, you know, where we're actually able to hear her voice, really forces us to adjust any preconceptions we might have of her as a victim. And she comes across as incredibly feisty, she's ambitious, she's really determined to be considered equal to any male artist of her time. And in one letter she wrote to a patron famously, um, with me your illustrious lordship will not lose and you will find the spirit of Caesar in the soul of a woman. She was constantly challenging this sort of misogynistic attitude towards women in her letters. And it's very important, therefore, to kind of consider Artemisia in the context of her time, a time in which, you know, women were effectively the possession of men. You were the possession of your father until you were the possession of your husband. And so Artemisia really fought against that um, uh, and found incredible independence, not just as an artist, but also as a woman. And I think it's only in sort of that context that you really can appreciate um, the significance of her achievements. So Artemisia was born in Rome in 1593. She was the eldest child and the only daughter of the painter Orazio Gentileschi. Um, Artemisia's mother died when she was just 12 years old. So growing up really can't have been easy. Um, she was taught to paint um, by her father, Orazio, alongside her three brothers who were also trained with her. But her training was very, very different from theirs. It was, it was not at all conventional. Orazio was incredibly controlling. He had a fearful temper. We know this from, from contemporary reports. He rarely allowed her out of the house because, you know, as a young woman and a young unmarried woman, you were not free to sort of roam around unaccompanied and unchaperoned. And of course, her training, therefore, would have been very different from her brother's because every bit of an apprentice's training began with looking and copying the old masters. So you would go to the Sistine, C Sistine Chapel and you would copy Michelangelo's great ceiling. You, if you were living in Rome, you would certainly go and look at the classical sculpture on display and you would copy that. 
and artists who weren't in Rome would travel to Rome to do these things. And Artemisia, despite living in Rome and being incredibly talented, was completely shut off from this kind of aspect of the training. Um, and she really only had her father's works to see and, and the few works in sort of the churches around Rome that she may have had access to. In the church in which her mother was buried, Santa Maria del Popolo, there is this incredible chapel with um, two paintings by Caravaggio, who was a friend of her father's, and a painting by Nibale Carracci. So she would have had access to those. But you know, in talking about Artemisia in her early year, early career, you, you really do have to remember that she was not exposed to very much other than her father's paintings. Um, I mean, despite all these restrictions, Artemisia really did demonstrate extraordinary talent. Orazio um, writes a letter to the Grand Duchess in Tuscany in 1612, uh, saying that his daughter has been painting for three years and has no equal. And from that, we, we can you know, understand that Artemisia, by the age of about 16, was painting independently. And her very first known signed and dated painting is this. It's dated 1610, so she's about 16 or possibly 17 when she paints this picture, which is really extraordinary to think. You know, bearing in mind everything I've just said of how little she was exposed to. Um, and when you see this, you really do see that Orazio wasn't exaggerating. You know, his daughter clearly was incredibly talented. It's a work that I find incredibly mature. And I think, again, you know, I mentioned earlier her sort of gift as a storyteller. I think you see in this picture already, she has an incredible gift and sensibility for narrative, for, for, for painting stories. The, the, the subject itself is a familiar one. It's drawn from the Old Testament, from the Apocrypha, and it's, um, it tells of a young woman called Susanna who goes to her garden to bathe. And while she's bathing, two elderly men spy on her and um, they make sexual advances, which she then rejects. And then they threaten to accuse her of adultery anyway. Um, and if she doesn't comply to their demands, and this was punishable by death. Um, and what Artemisia does here, you know, which is very different from how this subject had been painted by others, is that she shows Susanna saying no. I mean, she is very clearly pushing them away. It is the physical rejection of the elders and her vulnerability, I think, that she really focuses on. And I think this is what really you can see already really distinguishes her from her contemporaries. The way in which this picture is painted is very like Orazio. So in terms of technique, you know, everything she's learned about painting, she's effectively learned from her father. Um, and in fact, so much so that some say this picture is by Orazio and merely has, you know, Artemisia's name on it. I don't actually buy into this theory because I think it undermines fundamentally what's so different about this picture, which is this extraordinary sensibility for the, 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 the heroine. Um, but, you know, it is staggering to think that a 17 year old would be able to achieve such, such quality and such kind of sensitivity and, um, you know, technical finesse, I think. Um, but it is, again, I think her, her sort of psychological understanding of women and also how naturalistic that body of Susanna is. You know, and these are two other pictures actually taken, a photograph taken in the exhibition where you can see, you know, she, she really understands and some of the press actually, the press reviews of the exhibition also talked about this, about how she understands how a woman, woman's body behaves and in pain, she sort of, you know, she embodies her pictures in a way. She, 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 she knows what a woman's, you know, uh, uh, how it behaves, how it falls, in a way that really can't be said of Orazio's paintings of, of nudes. Now, Orazio's home um, functioned as both a domestic space and an artist's studio. So you have to imagine you've got models and painters and prospective patrons going in and out all the time. But we know that Artemisia was effectively kept well out of sight. She was shut away. Um, but it was in this space, in this sort of house studio, that she was um, raped by the painter Agostino Tassi. He, he came in one afternoon and forced himself upon her in May 1611. So Artemisia is just 17, it's just a, a few months after the painting of the Susanna that I just showed you. Now Tassi was a, a successful painter in his own right. He painted um, landscapes, seascapes, but he was best known for um, Quadratura, which was this sort of illusionistic architecture, and I'm showing you here um, a particularly successful one, uh, and one in which he collaborated with Orazio. So Orazio, he would, you know, Tassi would paint the architecture and then Orazio would 
paint the figures that sort of populate it. And at the time of the rape, Orazio and Tassi were working on this, on the Casino delle Muse, which, which was uh, in a space that belonged to the, to the Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Scipione Borghese. He was the papal nephew, a very powerful um, patron and collector. And it was here that Tassi and Orazio met, they knew each other, Orazio considered him a friend, and, um, and Tassi found a way to uh, enter Orazio's home when he was out uh, and attacked uh, Artemisia. Now, in the months following the rape, Artemisia, we know, entered into a relationship with Tassi under the false hope that he would marry her. Uh, and when after some months it was clear that Tassi was not to make uh, a sort of honorable woman out of her, Orazio decided to bring charges against him. Uh, and these charges are said to be for forcibly deflowering her, for taking away her virginity. And this is because by doing this, he had really dishonored the, the Gentileschi family name. And he was desperate. Orazio was seeking one of two possible outcomes. One, that Tassi would marry his daughter, or second best to that would be that he would at least provide a dowry for his daughter. She was effectively damaged goods by this point. Um, and now the reason this whole story is so well known is that all the transcripts of the rape trial still exist. It's amazing. They're in the um, Archivio di Stato in Rome, and they're shown in the exhibition for the very first time. And I chose to display them in a, in a case right next to the Susanna painting. And when you read these, um, when you read this, the, the transcript very closely, it, you know, Tassi really emerges as a, as a sort of real scoundrel. He's a sexual predator. I mean, he's clearly been, um, you know, harassing her for some months. And it's not surprising his nickname was Los Marjasso, which means the braggart. He was incredibly foul mouthed and, and very pompous and full of himself. And it transpired during the trial that Tassi was already married. And in fact, had been involved in a failed assassination attempt on his wife. Uh, and in addition, he'd been tried for robbery, theft, incest with his sister-in-law. I mean, you know, he's a really murky, murky character. Um, and Artemisia's testimony during the trial provides a really sort of shocking and very vivid account of what happened. Um, and she makes very clear in her description that she, she, you know, she fought back, she resisted, but she also fought back. She pulled his hair, she scratched his face, she grabbed a dagger from a nearby drawer. You know, it is an amazing thing that we have this kind of document that, that, that makes it feel very, very real, this story. And it's why it's captured people's imagination so much. And you might ask yourself, why on earth did I want to spend so long on this document and include it, having said at the beginning that I didn't want to dwell too much on the rape. But I think what it does is it gives Artemisia her voice. And it's a very rare thing to be able to give an artist 400 years on a voice, uh, particularly a woman artist. And for me, it's very important that her voice came through in the exhibition and her personality came through. Um, the page I decide to open the document out, which I'm showing you here, um, which is effectively a bundle of legal papers bound in this, in this volume. Um, it's actually um, an episode where, where Artemis is brought to the Tor di Nona prison in Rome. She's brought before Tassi and there's a judge present and some officials. And they ask her if she's willing to confirm her earlier testimony under judicial torture. Now, it might seem really awful to us to think that the victim is basically tortured, but uh, it's important to remember this was an accepted means by which Artemisia's testimony could effectively be um, taken as, as true, because otherwise her, her voice counted for nothing, you know, her testimony counted for nothing. And so Artemisia was really left with no choice. She knew that she had to comply. And what they chose was something called the Sibylle, and it was a system of cords that were wrapped around your fingers and then you had a running string that they would pull. And as they tightened, effectively it could break your fingers. And you have to remember, you know, she's only 17, well, she's 18 by the time this happens. But she's a painter and there they are, you know, torturing her and potentially breaking her fingers, you know, that she, she needs for her profession. Um, and the scribe writes everything down that is happening. And I've, I've put a translation on screen for you. And while Artemisia speaks, they write, you know, Basically, they describe what's happening in Latin and then they write verbatim as the words come out of the witness's mouth. They write in Italian what they say. And about halfway down, as they're torturing her, you can see here, I'm just pointing with my arrow. 
she says, è vero, è vero, è vero, è vero. It's true, it's true, it's true, it's true. And she repeats this again and again throughout, even later here. And it's just staggering to think how, how composed she is and how even in such a stressful situation she manages, you know, she's so determined to, 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 to sort of get Tassi sentenced really and to pay for what he's done. But then what's wonderful is, I was talking about her personality, you get this wonderful sort of flash of her fiery temperament because in the same thing, she's saying it's true, it's true, and she's being tortured. And then she turns to Tassi and says, questo è l'anello che tu mi dai, e queste sono le promesse. This is the ring that you've given me and these are your promises. She's of course meant referring to her wedding ring. You know, instead of a wedding ring, you've given me this. I have ropes tightened around my fingers, you know, and this, these are your promises. And I love that about her because you get a real sense of her spirit, even in such a sort of stressful situation. Now, enduring this um, really meant that her, her word was, was, was accepted and Tassi was found guilty. So he was um, sentenced to exile from Rome, although this punishment wasn't actually enforced. And on the day following the trial, um, Artemisia was married off to the younger brother of the, the, the lawyer who'd effectively helped put together her legal defense for her father. It was an arranged marriage that had been arranged during the trial. Um, and with him, she moved to Florence. But out of this sort of disaster or, or incredibly challenging episode in her life, it, 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 she sort of transformed this into a real opportunity because she left her father's studio, she left her father's house. And in Florence, you know, a completely new chapter of her life began. And it was here that she lived for about seven years and she really found her sort of personal freedom, her professional independence. She learned to read and write. You have to remember women of Artemisia's social class were just not educated. And in the trial, she says, you know, I'm illiterate. I, I, I can't read, you know, I can't write and I can barely read. Um, and in Florence, she teaches herself to do so. She is the first woman to join the Artists Academy, an academy that had lasted, you know, been founded sort of 50 years previously. So she's accepted into the Artists Academy. And this is incredibly important because not only are you finally able to meet other artists, you have to remember in Rome, she met nobody. Um, you can meet prospective patrons, you can meet writers, poets, intellectuals. And this for her was, it opened so many doors. And of course, she what she really wanted was the patronage of the Medici, the ruling family in Florence. Um, and at their court, she met musicians and writers and, and intellectuals. She became a friend of Galileo Galilei, the, the astronomer, and also of the poet Michelangelo Buonarroti, the younger, who was the great nephew of the very famous Michelangelo. And it was for Buonarroti that she painted um, this picture. It's an allegory of inclination. And it's, a, it's painted on canvas, but it's sort of set into the ceiling. So in fact, it's the one near the window here um, on the screen. And um, this was in the Galleria, which was a whole room dedicated to sort of Michelangelo's genius, if you like. And she was given the task of painting inclination, meaning here a sort of innate or natural talent, um, you know, uh, for painting. And I think that in itself is really interesting that that commission is given to a woman. She's the only woman working on this whole scheme. She's paid three times as much as any other artist. Um, and she paints a, fig, a sort of female personification of inclination who resembles her quite, quite closely. It's not a literal self-portrait, but people seeing this, knowing it was by a woman, would have associated the figure of inclination with Artemisia. It's a very clever um, tactic. Um, and very daring, and even more daring if you think that originally this figure was, was naked. She was not clothed. Uh, and that green drapery, the sort of the shimmering drapery was actually added much later in the 17th century. So, you know, very daring of her to paint a, a nude woman sort of resembling herself. And it was in Florence also that Artemisia painted some of her most famous works, um, namely the second version, the version on the right in this picture, of her Judith beheading Holofernes, um, which I'm showing you a photo from inside the exhibition where we've been able to, to, to bring the two versions together. For me, it's one of the great highlights of the show. I mean, despite how famous these pictures are, it is really thrilling to stand in front of them. Um, the one on the left, she actually painted in Rome and it's today in, in the Capo di Monte in Naples. And she probably brought a tracing of that picture with her to Florence. Um, and you can see it's smaller, it's been cut along the top and along the left. So it originally probably was much closer in format to the painting you see now on the right. 
uh, but she also introduced some changes um, in the picture on the right. So you can see not just the color changes, but uh, the, the dress that Judith wears is a much kind of richer uh, gold and damask cloth. Um, there's the bracelet, there's some beautiful details in the jewelry and so on. And I, I really think this picture was destined for, for the Medici court and almost certainly was a sort of showpiece uh, to win the patronage of the Grand Duke Cosimo de' Medici. And I think once again, looking at these pictures, you can see what a great storyteller Artemisia is. So again, it's a familiar, you know, biblical subject. It shows the Old Testament figure of Judith, who to defend and save her city of Bethulia that's under siege, she goes into the enemy camp to dine with the general Holofernes and he becomes inebriated. And as he sort of passes out, she grabs his sword and cuts off his head. And then she escapes the camp with his head as booty to sort of prove to her city that they've, you know, that, you know, they, they, they've overcome their, their, their enemy. Um, now, what Artemisia does is give us this really violent and really unflinching account of what happened. I mean, the, the, the way the blood sort of streams down the bed sheets and spurts and splatters on her bodice. I mean, it is really very, very shocking. Um, of course, Caravaggio had painted the subject before in an equally shocking and violent way. Um, but what's interesting in, in Caravaggio's painting is that the Judith is totally impassive. She's very statuesque. She seems, you know, she's not sort of not the slightest bit of effort in cutting off this head. Um, and, and the maidservant, who was usually an old woman, not a young woman as Artemisia would have her, is standing ready with the bag to sort of bundle the, the head in. But here Artemisia, what she does, I think so brilliantly, is she brings the maidservant not just as a sort of bystander, she brings her inside, she's pinning Holofernes down, and she becomes a sort of active participant. So these women are in this deed together. And I think it's also a profound understanding that I don't think a woman like Judith would have been able to overcome Holofernes on her own. So she needs her maidservant to help. And for me, this whole picture is about this kind of female strength, both physical strength, but also the resolve, um, the determination in Judith's face. Um, but, you know, she can see she's sort of physically struggling to, to, to do this thing. Um, and I think this is where Artemisia is really exceptional because she really gets under the skin of her, of her heroines, of her protagonists. And it's why her stories are so believable. You know, they're so truthful. Now, very different is um, the picture on the right, which shows the moment immediately after. So the deed is done and, and, and you know, Judith and her maidservant now have to escape the enemy camp. And rather than have a bag, they, they have bundled his head into a basket. And what she's done is she's reworking a very, very a highly original reworking of her father's painting, which is on the left. And in fact, both, both are in the exhibition and I've hung them so you can sort of see Artemisia's picture through a doorway so you can sort of make the connection. Um, and what Artemisia has done is she's brought the two women even closer together. And I think you get a real sense of that sort of sisterhood. And then by cropping the composition, she's got rid of all that space around the figures and it's incredibly claustrophobic. You get a sense of them inside the tent and they're sort of startled and turn, turning towards the noise and now they have to escape. So I think what she's managed to do is evoke something in paint, which is very hard to evoke. She's evoking fear. Um, you get a real sense of their sort of, you know, turning, you know, starting towards the noise. Um, and, you know, that sort of gesture of putting her hand on her maid servant's shoulder in Horatio's painting is quite sort of reassuring. But in Artemisia's, I think, it takes on a real sense of urgency and that it's, it's definitely a different sort of um, emotional kind of caliber in Artemisia's painting. And I think it's a very interesting comparison to make because you can see here's a, not only a subject that's identical, but a very similar composition. But what Artemisia does with it is to give it that, that, that incredible kind of forcefulness um, which, which I think is slightly lacking from Morazio's, you know, beautifully painted, but quite theatrical rendition. Now, Artemisia frequently turned to using her own image in Florence. So we know of three different self-portraits by Artemisia where she takes on different sort of roles, different guises, and they're, they're all brought together in the exhibition for the first time, which is so exciting. The picture on the right is um, the painting that we acquired at the National Gallery in 2018. It's the first picture by Artemisia to enter a public collection in this country. Um, and it's a very new discovery. It was only discovered in 2017. So it's the very first time I've been able to hang it alongside other 
pictures by Artemisa. So it's a real thrill for me. And you can see, even though the formats are quite different, and you know, in the little one, she's a little martyr saint, in the central one, she's a loop player, and in the right, she's St. Catherine. Um, you can see there are definitely similarities, particularly in the pose, this sort of thing of turning your body one way and turning your head the other. And you have to remember she's probably painting herself from a mirrored reflection. So that's probably why also she takes on this kind of pose in this sort of format. Um, and we don't really know why she chose to paint herself in these years. Um, she may have done it for practical reasons. You know, it's a lot easier and a lot cheaper to paint yourself than it is to hire models. And towards the end of her life, Artemisia in her letters complains about how expensive it is to pay for models um, to pose. Um, in fact, she says, you know, even when you find good ones, they fleece you and they, they're a complete headache. So, you know, you have this real sense that she's very reluctant to pay someone else if she can pose for it herself. Um, but I think there's also an element of this being a very clever marketing tool. She's, she's, she's a clever businesswoman, Artemisia. And I think she knows, very like Rembrandt knows, um, you know, a couple of decades later, that if you put yourself in your paintings, you not only disseminate your pictures, but you disseminate an image of yourself through your art. And it, it, it's, in my view, also a very clever marketing strategy. It's something also that's not unusual in Florence. Artists put themselves in their pictures all the time. Um, and the most famous example is this, uh, by a, a contemporary of Artemisia's. In fact, he was a friend of Artemisia's. Um, and in this very famous picture, this one is in the Royal Collection, but there's one also in the Palazzo Pitti. Um, Allori famously posed for Holofernes himself, so it's his head. Uh, and the woman holding his head, Judith, is actually um, modeled on his lover, La Mazzafira. And the old maid is actually La Mazzafira's mother, so his sort of pseudo mother-in-law. And this is a very famously known. Um, and Artemisia would certainly have known this picture. She knew Cristofano Allori very well. He was godfather to her son, Cristofano as well, who shared his name. So, um, you know, it's important again to think of Artemisia adopting these ideas of putting yourself in your pictures because it's very much what they do in Florence. Um, now, following our acquisition of our self-portrait as St. Catherine, um, we did some sort of technical research, as I mentioned before, it was only discovered in 2017. So we did a lot of technical investigation of our picture and we could see that it was very closely related to her self-portrait as a loop player. So we did tracings of our respective pictures and we sent ours to Hartford in Connecticut and they sent theirs to us. And it became clear that in fact, what she'd done is she traced elements of her composition and sort of transpose those into our picture. And the picture on the right, which I hope isn't concealed too much by the little um, you know, zoom, <laughs> zoom <laughs> pictures, um, we superimpose the two and it gives you a sense in the graphic overlay, you can see that the head and the shoulders are perfectly aligned. And it's a really interesting thing because it, it gives us a clue as to how Artemisia is working. Um, in a way, our picture was a sort of missing link. And you know, she's obviously, tracing successful compositions. She's working on multiple pictures at once in the studio. And I think in the past, people have been reluctant to think of Artemisia as a commercial painter, but of course she was. She had to set up on her own in Florence. We know she's permanently in sort of financial difficulty. Um, and, you know, she would have replicated compositions that were popular. And there's clearly a demand for this sort of picture. Another picture that's um, very closely related to ours is this picture of St. Catherine, which is today in the Uffizi. Um, here too, um, the Uffizi undertook some technical investigation of this picture at the beginning of the year, and they actually did x-rays of their painting. And what I show you on the right is an x-ray of their picture, so an x-ray of the painting in the middle. And I mean, you don't have to be a trained sort of scientist to see that underneath the picture you can see uh, one identical to ours. So what she did was she painted a picture like the National Gallery painting and then painted on top something completely different. And this is where x-rays allow you to see how pictures change over time, the different paint layers. Um, and I think what's really interesting here again is that this too must have been in the studio at the same time. So she's, you know, adapting pictures, replicating, copying, borrowing. And of course, we don't know the circumstances in which these pictures were commissioned. Um, we don't know if this was because someone came and said, turn this into a St. Catherine, turn this one into a loop player. But um, it does show that she's, she's, you know, commercially minded. And that when pictures, uh, you know, certain compositions were particularly successful or in demand, 
artists did replicate them. In Florence is where Artemisia's sort of personal life also underwent quite dramatic change. So she was there for seven years and she, she was pregnant for about five of them. She had five children in five years and only two of those children actually survived infancy and only one made it to adulthood. Um, despite the, the, the vast number of children, her marriage was not a happy one. And she began a very passionate love affair in Florence with a nobleman who worked for the Frescobaldi. His name was Francesco Maria Maringhi. And in 2011, an extraordinary discovery was made of their love letters or, or a group of letters, about 35 letters that Artemisia wrote to him. And they're written predominantly once she'd left Florence. So you have to imagine she's writing to her sort of distant lover. Um, and I mean, they are absolutely extraordinary. And I borrowed uh, five letters for the exhibition because again, the idea of, of, of being able to, to, to sort of hear her voice and in such a kind of um, unchecked way, because these aren't formal letters to patrons. These are very intimate letters to her lover. So you, you, you get a sense of that they're really written in sort of stream of consciousness. So you get her talking with equal sort of passion and fervor about the loss of her belongings, um, you know, her sort of yearning for her lover, she writes one letter after the death of her little boy, Christophe, where she says she's just pulled apart by grief. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're really incredible, incredible sort of testimonies in a way of her personality. And she does not come across as a sort of victim of her times. You know, she, she's vulnerable, sure. She's jealous one minute. She, she's very sensual in another, you know, and, and I think you can really put together a picture of Artemisia reading these letters. And I think for her, she's, as I said at the beginning, she's become this sort of icon. Um, so there's, a, it is so moving to see things written in, in her hand. And you can see, even if you don't speak Italian, you know, they're very legible, her signature is very legible. And, you know, I'm very pleased that we were able to borrow these. They were restored for the show. Um, and it's the first time they've been seen publicly outside of Italy. And, and I think they add an incredible, sort of touch. Um, you'll see she signs this letter, Artemisia Lomi. So Lomi is the name of her paternal grandfather. Um, and she uses that name in Florence because her family were originally from Pisa. So what she wants to do by using the word Lomi rather than Gentileschi is to make people in Tuscany to think of her as a compatriot so that they think, you know, she's one of us. And, you know, it's a very clever marketing tool again. And she also signs her pictures in Florence, very obviously Lomi rather than Gentileschi. But in 1620, she, she leaves Florence, returns to Rome, um, almost certainly because of financial difficulties. And then she readopts the name Gentileschi. And when she returns to Rome, she is, you know, an incredibly successful artist. She has completely transformed herself into an artist um, of success. She is a celebrity, really, and an object of fascination for collectors who not only want pictures by her hand, you know, but they also want portraits of her. So you find you have paintings and medals and engravings and drawings. She, she really has become this, this sort of celebrity um, at the time. And that's really because the, in Rome, particularly, there were no celebrated women artists, really. Um, and you have to remember when she left, you know, she left under the sort of cloud of the trial and she comes back, this woman who's sort of, you know, had seven successful years in Florence. And in Rome, she continues to paint um, these sort of biblical historical subjects, paintings in which women are often the main protagonists. And it's what her success and her reputation were effectively built on. Uh, and we have to remember that these subjects are not unusual. Um, you know, plenty of others treated these themes of Judith and, and, and of Susanna. But what Artemisia brought was this very particular realism and sort of psychological depth to her heroines. And I think for collectors, the, you know, these depictions of extreme violence or nudity would definitely have had a sort of additional appeal because they were painted by a woman. Uh, and I think Artemisia knew that this was a unique selling point. She was well aware of it. Um, and, you know, patrons would say, you know, would determine a subject of a painting. They would commission a Judith or a Susanna but they knew that they'd get something different from Artemisia. You know, she would provide this sort of feminine sensibility and viewpoint, if you like. Um, and that of course was something no male artist could provide. 
So Artemisa stays in Rome for some time and then goes on to Venice uh, towards the end of the 1620s. And this is probably the only picture that we know that she painted in Venice. It's among Artemisa's largest works. Um, it's one of her most ambitious. Once again, looks at, a, at an Old Testament subject of Esther, the Jewish bride who, who, who faints before her husband, the King of Persia. She's come to ask him to overturn a decree that, that states that all Jewish people should be killed. Um, and this was punishable by death to sort of come before the king without being sort of invited. And she's been fasting for three days and here she faints in his presence. Um, and he does in fact overturn the decree. So she was then sort of heralded as this great sort of figure of courage. Um, and it's a subject that's le it's less common than Judith and Susanna, but it, you know, it's not, it's not entirely you know, unique. Um, and the composition seems to be inspired by this picture by the Renaissance Venetian painter Paolo Veronese. Now, this picture on the right, which is today in the Louvre, was actually in Venice in the 17th century, and, and Artemisia may well have known the picture at first hand. Um, and it just shows how she's sort of really absorbing what's around her, and her style changes so much depending on where she's working. So it, it's hard to imagine that the picture we see on the left is by the same person as some of the pictures I've already shown you. Um, and she made a lot of changes in this picture. She struggled, I think, with the scale of this picture. Um, and you know, she, she, she made quite a few, few changes as she went along. But um, originally this picture was closer to the Veronese. Now Artemisia left, to, left Venice to escape the plague in 1630 and she settled in Naples. And this is a city that in the 17th century was under Spanish rule. Um, and Naples really gave Artemis again, once again, you know, unprecedented opportunities. She was able to work on a huge scale. I mean, these are the, this is the first opportunity she has to actually paint an altarpiece. Um, the picture on the left, I'm showing you here a detail of the signature. It's 1630. So she's in her thirties and it's her first altarpiece. So until this moment, all of Artemisia's pictures are really only on display in people's homes. There's nothing on public display. And suddenly in Naples, that changes. You know, she's able to paint for churches. She's working alongside other Neapolitan artists. Um, in this picture, which shows San Gennaro, who's the patron saint of Naples. And I'm showing you here, sorry, a rather shaky video of where it normally hangs. So I thought it was quite fun if you could then see it hanging in the church, in the Baroque church, in Pozzuoli, it's the cathedral there. Um, and here she, she provided three out of the 12 very large altarpieces. Um, and what you can see is that she's been accepted by people there. And she, she, you know, this was not the case with other artists who traveled to Naples. And I think she was accepted because I don't think artists there saw her as a threat. She was a woman, she didn't paint frescoes, she wasn't vying for the big commissions. And I think, you know, as a result, she, she, she was very much accepted by the artistic community. Um, she worked for the King of Spain as well, because of course, because of the Spanish connections with Naples. So here, this is one of six paintings that she contributes to a cycle, um, all of which are now in the, in the Prado. Um, and it's the, the birth and the naming of John the Baptist, a sort of quite feminine subject, if you think. And what's wonderful is she completely <laughs> sidelines the Baptist parents. So his mother, who's just given birth, is in the top left corner. His father's relegated to the margin, and she just concentrates on the midwives. And, you know, the midwives who are sort of testing the water temperature, who are about to bathe the child. It, it's a wonderfully domestic picture. And it's very witty because in this picture, which is about naming, Zacharias, the father, is writing down his, the name of his son. Artemisia has signed on this crumpled piece of paper as if, you know, Zacharias has written her name down and then decided, no, no, I'm going to discard that. I'm going to write someone else's name. So she's very witty as well, and in, particularly in the way she, she positions her signatures in her paintings. Now, we don't know um, why or when Artemisia came to England, um, but Charles I had been trying to get her to come to London for some time, and she came in the late 1630s. Charles had dispatched her brothers twice to escort her back from Naples, and she'd refused. Um, but when she does arrive, it, it's not documented, but we think she might have worked on this ceiling with her father. It's the last great commission by Orazio. Orazio had come to London in 1626. He was, he was at the court of Charles I um, until his death, just over 10 years. Um, and this commission was for Queen Henrietta Maria, for the Queen's house at Greenwich, which is on the left. And the ceiling was moved in the 18th century to Marlborough House in St. James's. Um, and it's very, very damaged. But I mean, it's, it's reasonable to assume that Artemisia may have been called in to also contribute to this, um, you know, quite sort of feminine 
object because the ceiling is, is full of sort of female protagonists and it would have made sense for Queen Henrietta Maria to want this sort of celebrated female painter to work on it. But of course it's in London that she paints this, which is one of her most famous pictures and the picture with which the exhibition actually ends. Um, and it's her supremely confident, it's so-called self-portrait as the allegory of painting. And here Artemisia brilliantly conflates these two ideas of self-portraiture and allegory because she creates this image which you know, follows very closely the description of what painting or pittura is. Um, and you know, it's described in a handbook by this man Cesare Ripa, which was a sort of iconographical handbook used by artists. Um, uh, she's described as a beautiful woman with bl black disheveled hair, arched eyebrows showing imaginative thought, a gold chain from which hangs a mask, and in one hand she holds her brush and in the other her palette with clothes of evanescently colored drapery. And you can see Artemis is very faithful to that text. And in being a female painter, she's inevitably um, making us or intending us to see her and associate her with this personification. And she even places her signature, which is actually three letters, A-G-F, Artemisia Gentileschi featured, right on the stone in the center. So right beneath that painter's palette. So you're clearly meant to associate her with the image. I mean, it's not a literal self-portrait. She would have been in her forties when this was painted. Um, but uh, it's also incredibly difficult to imagine how you would paint yourself at this angle. But there's no question that, that the sort of image embodies what Artemisia felt painting was. And that's this very kind of physical act. You can see she's rolled up her sleeves. You know, she's very energetic. It's not sort of a contemplative picture. Um, she feels very sort of, you know, she's about to attack the canvas. She's about to embark on her next picture. And for me, it's that it's a picture that always calls to mind the words that Artemisia wrote to her patron um, towards the end of her life. And she wrote, you know, I will show your illustrious lordship what a woman can do. And, you know, to me, that's what's really evoked in this picture. But she doesn't stay long. She stays a few months after Orazio's death. And then she moves back to Naples, where she remains till the end of her life. And she carries on painting, you know, uh, this is her last known work, which is also, you know, funnily enough, as Susanna, um, uh, painted in 1652. So she's, she's almost 60 when she paints this. And it's just so different. And I always find it so interesting to look at the three Susannas from three moments in her career. And, you know, these are all signed and dated and documented, but they look like they're by three completely different people. And um, I think it's a difficult thing with Artemis. I think she is a real chameleon because I think she's so brilliantly adept at adapting her style according to the tastes of patrons in the cities in which she worked. Um, and I think what they do have in common is this very powerful imagery. And of course, you know, this, this exceptional talent for, for a painter of the time and, you know, she really is one of the greatest storytellers of the 17th century. Thank you. I'm just going to stop sharing. And then if there are any questions, I'm happy to. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, we've got time for questions now. So if you want to just um, kind of indicate in the chat bar and then I can call out to people and, uh, and you can ask your question directly. Or if you'd like me to ask on your behalf, then just type it into the chat uh, directly. Uh, Mat Matilda, we'll start with you. So if you unmute Hello. yourself. Hi, good evening. Thank Hello. you very much. It was really, really fantastic presentation. Thank you. Just a quick question. I want you to understand what was the, <clears throat> the position of Artemisia's father during the process? Was he supportive? Did he encourage the, his daughter to, I mean, to become public with such a delicate, you know? Yes. Well, and, uh, it, it was. It yeah. It was. It was her father who who actually brought the charges against Tassi. I think it, it's not known whether Orazio knew about their relationship for those months after the rape itself. Um, I suspect he did, and he thought that Tassi would do the right thing and marry her. And when it became clear he wouldn't. And that's when he brings the charges against um, Tassi. So Orazio, I mean, he doesn't get up in the witness box. I mean, the astonishing thing is he puts his daughter through that 
it is yeah. all about it, it's basically all about his own honor the honor of his own family name none of it was really about Artemisia's feelings but you know it wasn't in the 17th century you know it wouldn't have been about Artemisia's feelings or any kind of psychological damage she might have suffered it was entirely about the honor of the family name and that's why also he arranged the marriage before the trial had even ended okay okay thank you very much you're welcome Thank you, Matilda. Um, Lucy, would you like to unmute mute yourself? And you could, um, if you wanted to ask a question about um, the sealing it. Uh, Hi, I've unmuted, I think. There you go. Um, so my first question was about why was the ceiling moved from Greenwich to Marlborough House? And is Marlborough House open to the public now? Yeah, no, I, I don't actually know why. I don't know if it was conservation reasons or building reasons, but um, it was in the early 18th century. And the terrible thing, it was it was that the surface area in Marlborough House is quite different. So it was actually mutilated and cut down to fit the ceiling in Marlborough House. So what you're seeing, even in reproduction, is a, is a really butchered sort of version of uh, what was originally intended for the Queen's House. Um, it's very, very damaged. And in fact, when you see it, you can see where it's been cut because, you know, the, the, the smashes it, are now quite obvious, as is the restoration. But it's set in and it's incredibly difficult to restore. Um, Marlborough House is now the Commonwealth Building, so it's not easy to see, um, certainly not at the moment. I, I know they did occasionally do tours, but you would have to tour the whole building so you can't just go and look at the ceiling. But what we did do, we instigated with this exhibition um, that so I should say the paintings are owned by the Royal Collection, even though they're in a building that doesn't belong to the Royal Collection. And what we did with the exhibition is we instigated a collaboration with Google Arts and Culture for the exhibition. And one of the things that they did as a result was they took their incredible cameras, fantastic photographs of the ceiling, which until now have not been available even on the Royal Collection website. So if you go to the Google Arts and Culture platform, and search for the Royal Collection ceiling, you also get a commentary from the Royal Collection curator. Thank you. Um, Eugenie, did you want to ask a question about the process of curating? Hello, yes, uh, thank you so much for the amazing talk. Um, I was just wondering how you went through the process of curating this exhibition. Oh gosh, <laughs> how long have I got? <laughs> um, no, I think, I suppose um, the first thing is, is how do you get the idea? That was quite easy because we just bought our painting in 2018. So the idea for an exhibition came very soon after that because we thought it was really pretty shocking that no exhibition had ever been done in this country on Artemisia despite her having even worked here. So once we had the idea, it was up to me to sort of think, what could I do in the time I had? So I had about 15 months, which is not very long. You normally have about four or five years for these large international sort of Sainsbury Ring type shows. Um, but I was really clear from the beginning in my mind, I needed, I wanted it to be really selective. There's so many pictures, you know, attributed to her and I just wanted the best. So I chose the sort of 30 best pictures. And to be honest, I didn't really have a B list in this show. It was either we get this picture or otherwise I, there's nothing really that can replace it. So I was very clear in my head, the narrative that I wanted to tell. And it was, like I said at the beginning, it was this idea of showing not just the greatness of her art, but giving a more rounded view of Artemisia as a woman. So the letters were really important to me from the very beginning. Um, the trial, less so. We only decided in January to borrow that, funnily enough. And the reason I did is because I realized as the kind of hype of this exhibition, we were nearing the sort of opening and the press and so on. And it's the thing that everybody knows about her. And I felt Borrowing that transcript would tell that story, but in a quite sensitive and unsensational way. And also, the more I worked with the pictures and the letters and I wrote the catalogue, I realised her voice was so strong and it was another part of that puzzle of kind of giving her her voice as a 17 year old, as well as when she was in her 20s and later on in her life. So that's how it came about. And then we worked really hard, really fast um, to get the loans. But I, I mean, I got everything I asked for, which is pretty amazing I, that doesn't normally happen I think people felt very well inclined because we would bought the first picture to enter a, a collection in this country I think the sort of rarity of that really convinced people this was also quite a pure kind of project it was sort of showing her at her best I mean I have to just add the great difficulty was the postponement because of course the show was due to open in April so I effectively spent most of lockdown renegotiating all the loans for the autumn because obviously a lot of the paintings have been promised to other projects, which have also been pushed. So there was all this uncertainty. 
Thank you. Um, the next two questions relate to Caravaggio. So I'm just going to ask, so, um, so one, what is known about her exposure to him while she, while she was in Rome? And what influence do you think um, he had on her treatment of light? Mm. Or possibly form so as on well? the first, um, I mean, she would certainly have been aware of Caravaggio. I mean, everybody was in Rome. And you have to remember, if she's born in 1593, she starts working in the studio probably when she's 12 or 13. So that very first decade of the 17th century is when Caravaggio just sort of explodes um, on the Roman art scene. Um, we know that uh, Orazio, her father and Caravaggio knew each other just in those years. Um, they even shared studio props. We know that from another trial where they got involved in, in sort of some scurrilous poems. Um, so they knew each other. So it's, it's conceivable that Caravaggio would have been in their home, um, but she really was shut away from that. So I think she would have known his pictures in public spaces in the churches. And I think she would have been aware very much of the kind of revolution that he brought about in the manner of painting in that first decade of the 17th century. But most of her knowledge of Caravaggio would be filtered through her father because Orazio himself, his style undergoes this dramatic change in that first decade of the 17th century influenced by Caravaggio. And I think that's the real key that Caravaggio sort of comes to Artemisia through her father, I think more than anything else. Um, and that is very much his use of light, his use of these very kind of naturalistically painted figures, the very tight crop of the pictures. Um, I mean, it becomes very obvious when you see the show, uh, you know, all her paintings bar one, they're all life-size figures. And the fact by cropping these compositions, you know, to sort of three quarter length or half length, you're brought incredibly close to the picture plane and you feel like you're in the painting. And this is really something that Caravaggio sort of really revolutionized. It's brilliant. You mentioned the postponement of the of the show. Um, do you know at this point if the show will be extended beyond oh. January? I'm afraid because of the postponement that that's not going to happen. But what I can say is we are opening next week um, on Wednesday. So we're taking bookings now. We've, we're also extending hours. So we're now going to be open nine till nine every day as opposed to just on Friday nights. Um, so hopefully there's that. And, and you know, the the great sort of calamity is, of course, we're not going to get any international visitors. I mean, a lot of the lenders haven't even been able to see their pictures in, installed and, and in the show, which is really sad. Um, but we've now just a week ago released an online film. So it's it's I'm giving a kind of a tour of the exhibition. And so that's also available. So I don't know if you have elderly relatives or people abroad who just can't travel to London. That's also a viable option. It's not the same, obviously, but. <laughs> um, that's great. Well, thank you. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions. So, um, Joanna Kennedy, can I ask you to unmute yourself? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much. I mean, both for the show and the talk, both fabulous. I just wondered if there's any evidence whether, uh, uh, that she influenced other women. Did she have uh, women, any pupils or? So we, we know very little about her studio. But what we do know is her one surviving child, Prudencia, was also a painter. So she, she presumably trained her own daughter. Um, she was, she knew other women though, other women artists. And, and one in particular was, you know, in Florence, then she went in Naples, she was also in London. She's called Giovanna Garzoni and she was, she paints these exquisite still lives on parchment. So more sort of traditionally what, what a woman would have painted. Um, and we know that she frequented female writers and female musicians. But I think she was definitely an oddity in Rome and in Florence. Um, well, and to a degree in Naples, actually. Um, the, the cities in Italy where women, there were more women painters were in Bologna. Um, I mean, there were lots of women painters in Florence, but most of them were nuns. You know, you would become <laughs> a nun. No, but they were, you know, you'd become a nun and you'd paint. Um, so- Nothing else I to think, do. I think, <laughs> nice thing to do. I think there is still quite a lot of work to be done on you know, the relationship she has, you know, to not see her completely as an isolate, you know, in isolation. Um, and her daughter, we know she taught her to paint, but we don't know anything by Prudencia. Thank you. Um, Maytek, did you want to ask a question? Yeah. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for this. Really enjoying Hi. it. Um, just one question. Out of curiosity, what brought her to London? Mm. Uh, we don't know. It's the subject of many um, fantastical films because, of course, you know, a lot of people like to think she sort of ran to her father's bedside 
uh, because he dies just a few months after she arrives. I think that's quite a romanticized view. I mean, the king has been trying to get her to come to London for about five years when she finally relents. And I think because he was trying to bring to the court as many international artists as possible, you know, Rubens, Van Dyck, um, and she is a celebrity. So I think there was that. I think the queen, Henrietta Maria, clearly kept Artemisia in her service for some time. Um, and because Arantia was effectively working for the queen, she probably also was pushing to try and bring the daughter as well. Um, mm. but, but she was very reluctant, clearly, to go to London, but she didn't like Naples either. But what she did was she used, Artemisia used the fact that the King of England was trying to get her to come to London to try and get jobs elsewhere. So her letters are saying, you know, oh, the King's trying to get me to go to London, but I'd much rather come to Modena, to Florence, to, you know, and none of it worked. So I think in the end, she relented. And she went for sort of, you know, almost two years, um, but did end up just going back to Naples. And, and very few pictures from London survived. So we only have the allegory of painting. There are about six or seven other pictures mentioned in the royal inventories that are lost. So watch this space. The Queen needs to look in her, in her attic. <laughs> thank you. Great. We've got so many. Um, complimentary uh, oh, comment thank you. here. So um, uh, there's one final, uh, we've got time for one final question. Um, there's a lot of questions about the recording. Yes, this the recording will be available in the next couple of days on our website. You'll also see some of the um, links to the uh, the on-demand tour that Letizia mentioned and also the um, documentary as well. Um, final question from Lucy about a um, loft painting. Hi, me again. Wasn't yeah. there a newly sort of rediscovered painting by her, by a dealer? Found yes, there's, a um, year ago or well, there were two. Yeah, there was a beautiful painting of Lucretia that was uh, found about a year ago in France, which I've seen, it, it's now restored, it's beautiful. Um, and then there was a painting of David and Goliath that was also a sort of new discovery about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, I mean, to be honest, as the fame of an artist grows, more and more pictures by her will be discovered, which is natural. Um, and I mean, both of those pictures were, you know, were offered to me to put in the show. I mean, I, I had a very tight selection, a sort of very tight list as it was. And I really felt strongly that there was a very strong narrative element to each of the objects that I put in the show. So I didn't add anything more. I mean, there are probably, uh, 70 or so pictures that are accepted by everyone as being by Artemisia and there are only 29 in my show so you know it was never intended to be a kind of including everything that's found by her but um the sort of newer discoveries in my exhibition are obviously the National Gallery's painting and also a beautiful Magdalene in ecstasy which only appeared in 2014 and is also being seen for the first time alongside other pictures by Artemisia so I felt there was sort of enough Kind of in the show that was new <laughs> as well as sort of some old favorites but um yes no i mean practically every week there's a new painting by artemisia being discovered <laughs> well lucky for us we get to lucky keep for us. <laughs> um, so uh, as i mentioned the um the links that um uh, for the um for the on-demand um guided tour are on in the chat bar now as well as the bbc documentary and um the recording for tonight's talk will be on there in the next couple of days as well. So Letizia, thank you so much. It was absolutely well. fascinating to hear about this truly remarkable painting, painter mm -hmm. and her life behind the canvas. And if these uh, comments that keep coming through, <laughs> <laughs> lots well, of- Thank you. Well, it was very fun. kind of everyone to tune in. No, thank you. <laughs> you know, it, um, it's truly remarkable. And, you know, you've taken the, uh, you've been so generous with your time and we're so appreciative that you um, have been here with us tonight in support of our bursaries appeal. And thank you to our audience for your wonderful questions. Um, if you'd like to join more of our virtually speaking talks, you'll see a link uh, to our forthcoming events in the chat. Next week, we have a talk from Latimerian Jim Smith. Um, as he talks through the journey of a fertilized egg to a 40 trillion cell human being um, in his talk titled How We Came to Be from Egg to Adult. Uh, we'll also have, um, a, you can also register for an evening of musicals and jazz, which will be the last um, Inspiring Minds, uh, virtually speaking, in the series for, 
this year before the Christmas break. So as you can see, there's quite a variety and um, something mm -hmm. for everyone. You'll also see a link to the donations page and a link to the video library that we alluded to before so that you can catch up on all the recordings so far. Well, sadly, that brings us to the end of tonight's talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for Letizia for a brilliant evening and hope to see you all again very soon.